The collaboration between Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke gave birth to one of the greatest films in the history of cinema, 2001 A Space Odyssey. But how did this brilliant collaboration come to pass? Well, we begin in New York City. In February of 1964, right around the time Dr. Strangelove came out, Stanley Kubrick was having lunch with Roger Karras when esteemed science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke's name came up. Roger Karras worked as the Columbia Pictures publicist for Dr. Strangelove and later the vice president of Kubrick's production company, Hawk Films, during the making of 2001. During their lunch together, Karras asked Kubrick what he had in mind for his next film, to which Kubrick responded, I'm going to do something on extraterrestrials. Kubrick mentioned he was reading everything by everybody to find a writer and a story that suited his interests on the subject, and Karras replied, why not just start with the best? This man was Arthur C. Clarke, whom Kubrick thought was a recluse, postulating that he was, quote, a nut who lived in a tree in India someplace. At this time, Clarke was living in Ceylon, now known as Sri Lanka. Karras sent a cable out to Clarke saying, Stanley Kubrick, Dr. Strangelove, Paths of Glory, etc. Interested in doing a film on ETs. Interested in you. Are you interested? Thought you were a recluse. And Clark responded, Frightfully interested in working with Infant Terrible. Contact my agent. What makes Kubrick think I'm a recluse? On March 31st, 1964, Stanley Kubrick wrote a letter to Clark in the hopes of a potential collaboration. The letter reads, Dear Mr. Clark, it's a very interesting coincidence that our mutual friend Karras mentioned you in a conversation we were having about a Questar telescope. I had been a great admirer of your books for quite a time and had always wanted to discuss with you the possibility of doing the proverbial really good science fiction movie. My main interest lies along these broad areas, naturally assuming great plot and character. 1. The reasons for believing in the existence of intelligent extraterrestrial life. 2. The impact, and perhaps even lack of impact in some quarters, such discovery would have on Earth in the near future. 3. A space probe with a landing and exploration of the Moon and Mars. Roger tells me you're planning to come to New York this summer. Do you have an inflexible schedule? If not, would you consider coming sooner with a view to a meeting, the purpose of which would be to determine whether an idea might exist or arise which could sufficiently interest both of us enough to want to collaborate on a screenplay? In that most agreeable event, I feel reasonably certain that further agreement for your services could then be reached with your agent. Incidentally, Sky and Telescope advertise a number of scopes. If one has room for a medium-sized scope on a pedestal, say the size of a camera tripod, is there any particular model in a class by itself, as the Quest R is for small, portable scopes? Best regards, Stanley Kubrick. In 2001 Italia's post on the letter, you can find the link in the description, he notes that Kubrick was interested in astronomy and was known to purchase every new gadget he could, so it is likely that his question about the Quest Star was sincere. Here you can see a picture of Clark during the 70s on a beach in Sri Lanka with a Quest Star telescope. Along with Clark, Marlon Brando, Johnny Carson, and Nazi-turned-NASA engineer Werner von Braun also reportedly owned Quest Star telescopes. The following month, on April 22nd, Kubrick and Clark met at New York's Plaza Hotel at a restaurant called Trader Vic's. Trader Vic's was a tiki-themed restaurant featuring an exciting and tremendous assortment of Polynesian, Chinese, and East Indian delicacies served in an authentic style and tropical atmosphere. A fun bit of trivia is that the 50-foot-long outrigger canoe displayed in the lobby was featured in the movie Mutiny on the Bounty. Allegedly, Kubrick and Clark talked about science fiction there for eight hours straight. Clark described Kubrick's appearance when they first met as a rather quiet, average-height New Yorker, and that he hadn't yet grown the beard that we see in many of 2001's set photos. He looked more like this. Clark also described Kubrick as being a night person, which affected their work schedule. On his first conversation with Kubrick, Clark was quoted saying, Even from the beginning, he had a very clear idea of his ultimate goal. He wanted to make a movie about man's relation to the universe, something which had never been attempted, much less achieved, in the history of motion pictures. Stanley was determined to create a work of art which would arouse the emotions of wonder, awe, even if appropriate, terror. Their conversations would last well through the spring of 1964 and carried them all over New York City, including the Guggenheim, Central Park, and a variety of movie houses. Clark thoroughly enjoyed all of what would be considered B-grade or worse science fiction movies and suggested that Kubrick watch Things to Come based on the H.G. Wells novel. Kubrick decided shortly after that that he would never take another movie suggestion from Clark again. According to technical advisor Fred Ordway, Kubrick found it incredible that someone as knowledgeable as Clark would quote, go see a horrible black and white science fiction film and just sit there like a school kid. In his book, The Lost Worlds of 2001, Clark said, of course there had been innumerable space movies, most of them trash, 
Even the few that had been made with some skill and accuracy had been rather simple-minded, concerned more with the schoolboy excitement of spaceflight than its profound implications to society, philosophy, and religion. This picture shows Kubrick and Clark in one of their early sessions at Kubrick's apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I was holed up in the Hotel Chelsea most of the time during the early stages. I went through my short stories and dug out six which seemed appropriate to our ideas, and I sold them all to Stanley. And one by one, he threw them away, and I bought them back. And they're still available. And Stanley decided that the best way to produce the film was to write a novel, or at least the outline of a novel, first. That way, Clark was quoted saying, before embarking on the drudgery of the script, we could let our imagination sort freely by developing the story as a novel upon which the screenplay would eventually be based. We would generate more ideas this way, Stanley thought, and give the project more body and depth, though I had never collaborated with anyone before in this way, but the idea suited me fine. In theory, therefore, the novel would be written with an eye on the screen, and the script would be derived from this. In practice, the result was far more complex. Toward the end, the novel and screenplay were being written simultaneously, with feedback in both directions. Directions. Some parts of the novel had their final revisions after we had seen the rushes based on the screenplay, based on earlier revisions of the novel, and so on. Around May 1964, after endless discussion and brainstorming, Kubrick and Clark decided to base the story of 2001 on Clark's short story titled The Sentinel, about the discovery of an artifact of an unknown origin. When asked why he and Kubrick chose The Sentinel as their jumping off point, Clark said this. Well, this, sort of, this idea is a kind of open-ended one. You can develop it in almost any direction, you see. And in fact, we develop it not only into the future, but into the past, because there's a flashback uh, to three million years ago showing how, this, uh, how in the past um, visitors to Earth affected our destiny. So there's this longest flashback in the history of movies to the dawn of man, and then on to the future to what this all leads to. However, the story of the Sentinel was meant to be the climax of both the book and the film. It was after they agreed to move this plot point closer to the beginning of the story that Clark brought forth more of his early novels and short stories to inspire the six additional building blocks for the novel and the screenplay. These were Breaking Strain, Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Orbiting, Who's There, Into the Comet, and Before Eden. Breaking Strain is a short story about a freighter stranded in space after a meteor collision. It soon becomes clear that there won't be enough oxygen for the two surviving crew members to survive. According to its Wikipedia article, the Discovery 1 spaceship from 2001 A Space Odyssey is very similar to the ship in Breaking Strain, in that both ships have a spherical command module which is located a great distance away from the nuclear-powered engines of the ship, connected by a long spine. Kubrick and Clark started writing the story of what would become 2001 A Space Odyssey using the working title, How the Solar System Was Won. Kubrick had a penthouse near Lexington Avenue in New York. On the night they finalized their deal, May 17, 1964 to be exact, they went out on Kubrick's balcony and saw a UFO. Now, it is highly likely that after all this talk of extraterrestrials, they were just seeing things. However, despite Clark's insistence that it wasn't aliens coming to stop them from making the movie, he couldn't offer an explanation. Clark thought it looked like a satellite, but there was no mention of a satellite passing at that time of night in the New York Times listing. Clark's friends at the Hayden Planetarium had an explanation. What Kubrick and Clark had seen was the Echo 1 satellite, which was a 100-foot balloon with a highly reflective aluminum surface. Clark kept a log during this time and noted various breakthroughs in the writing of 2001, including such entries as March 8th. Fighting hard to stop Stan from bringing Dr. Poole back from the dead, I'm afraid his obsession with immortality has overcome his artistic instincts. April 19th. Went up to the office with about 3,000 words Stanley hasn't read. The place is really humming now, about 10 people working there including two production staff from England. The walls are getting covered with impressive pictures and I already feel quite a minor cog in the works. Some psychotic who insists that Stanley must hire him has been sitting on a park bench outside the office for a couple of weeks and occasionally comes to the building. In self-defense, Stan has secreted a large hunting knife in his briefcase. The entries extend on into the production of the film after Kubrick moved the team to England and Clark spent a year back in Ceylon. On November 10th, he wrote this after visiting one of the sets. Accompanied Stan and the design staff into the Earth orbit ship and happened to remark that the cockpit looked like a Chinese restaurant. Stan said that killed it instantly for him and called for revisions. Must keep away from the art department for a few days. It would be that December that Kubrick would shoot his first images of 2001. 
which were of Floyd's encounter with the monolith at the TMA-1 excavation site. The scene was shot at Shepperton Studios instead of MGM Bournemouth like the rest of the film, because Shepperton was the only facility that could fit the massive excavation set. Because of this, Kubrick had a hard deadline to shoot that scene because another film was coming in to use the space. So Kubrick was forced to shoot such an important scene in only a week. After all of the production and post-production ended, and the public was about to experience the fruits of this beautiful collaboration, Clark looked back on his relationship with Kubrick at a press reception shortly before the film's premiere. Uh, I would like to begin by a number of tributes. First of all, to my colleague for the last four years, Stanley Kubrick. It's over four years ago that we started work on this, and it's been an extraordinary and exhilarating experience. I think I can safely say that in all that time, we never came to blows. We had no major disagreements. We had all sorts of uh, arguments about the best way of doing things. All these arguments were amicably re resolved. And it's looking back on it now, it seems incredible to me that such a complex and lengthy collaboration has gone so smoothly. This is really Stanley Kubrick's movie. I acted as the first stage booster and provided occasional guidance. Thanks for watching. This is a new series devoted to all things Kubrick and won't be limited to just things about 2001. Let me know in the comments what you think and if you're interested in more. And if you're new here, please hit that subscribe button now because there are plenty more videos on the way for cinephiles like you. I talked to the concierge at the Plaza Hotel and he said that Trader Vic's was located in the Plaza Food Hall on the 59th Street side. This is what it looks like today. Thanks again for watching.